Uh, I'm Chris Lane. I'm the CEO of Aspen Center for Environmental Studies. A little bit about our organization is we, our mission is educating for environmental responsibility. And we do that, as many of you know, lots of ways, educating in our schools, environmental science education, kids camps, naturalist tours all around the valley. We've got a rock bottom ranch that I know many of you have been to. We're teaching the world how to grow food without polluting rivers and emitting carbon. We're an active forest restoration program where we're doing on the ground habitats. Everybody's seen our prescribed burn with our partners up there. Work on Aspen Mountain to protect the trees from the Douglas fir beetle. And the biggest thing we do is connect people with nature. That's what ACES does. But I want to start with a, a few thoughts here. It, there's an organization called the American Dialect Society. And since 1990, they've designated a word of the year. So 2021, the word of the year was, anyone want to guess? No, insurrection. <laughs> We're going back in time. 2020, the word of the year was, and this is an easy one, softball pitch. COVID was the word of the year. Okay, here's a hard one. 2017, the word of the year was? Trump. Well, close on Trump. It's fake news was the word of the year. And all their rankings of all the words of the year, we've yet to have one environmental word as the word of the year. So climate's not been there. But guess what got an honorable mention? Climate anxiety. Uh, 2000, that was 2000, that was just last year. Anyway, so words matter and journalism matters. And you're gonna to learn tonight that journalism has the power to change the world. And with that, I wanna introduce Curtis Wackley, the executive director of Aspen Journalism to introduce our speaker tonight, Curtis. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you to ACES for partnering with us and, and putting this wonderful event on. Thank you to all of you for coming. I am Curtis Wackerly. I am the editor and executive director of Aspen Journalism, and we are a local nonprofit investigative news organization. Uh, our mission is to bring in-depth and investigative journalism to people with a stake in Aspen and the Roaring Fork Valley. Uh, we've been around, like I said, for uh, uh, since about 2000. And 11, uh, we focus uh, mainly on water uh, and environment reporting, uh, which are obviously big topics. And uh, we're building the capacity to, uh, to have a social justice desk. We have a, a data reporter. And, uh, and we work in this community. We, we publish our stories on our website. We, uh, we collaborate with, with local media and other media to, uh, to publish our work as well. And um, uh, we're just really happy to be here, and thank you all for coming. We want to say thank you to Grassroots TV for uh, uh, being there uh, to live stream this tonight. Hello to everyone who's uh, watching on the live stream and to people who are watching this in the future on the Internet. How are you? Um, uh, we are very honored to have Thomas L. Friedman with us uh, tonight uh, as our featured speaker. And just a little bit about Tom. He has been a reporter since 1978. Uh, you know, his first assignment was, uh, was covering the Lebanese Civil War as a, as a foreign correspondent. He's been with the New York Times since 1981, where he's held a number of positions, including the Jerusalem Bureau Chief, uh, the Chief Diplomatic Correspondent, the Chief White House Correspondent, and since 1995, he has been a foreign affairs columnist, where we've, uh, we've uh, all had the pleasure to read uh, his incisive commentary about uh, the forces that are shaping our world, about economics, foreign policy, uh, climate, and um, uh, he's won three Pulitzer Prizes, uh, two for international reporting and, uh, and one for distinguished commentary. He's the author of seven best-selling books. Uh, a great line that I'll borrow from a New Yorker profile is that he writes, uh, reassuring books about unsettling things. <laughs> Uh, so we'd like to invite him up to the stage to join us, uh, our guest of honor, Tom Friedman. Thank you. Great, thank you. Tom, thank you for being here. I'm going to start with the first question. We're going to have about 30, 40 minutes of dialogue here, and we'll open it up to a short Q&A with all of you at the end. But Tom, you know, what, let's start with just your background. What, what got you into journalism? Why? 
Um, well, first of all, this is just a treat to be with both of you to support these two great organizations. So thank you for having me, and thank you all for coming out on this afternoon and and uh, and supporting these groups too. So I was very lucky. I had that teacher uh, who changes your life. Um, her name was Hattie Steinberg. I took her journalism course in 10th grade at St. Louis Park High School, and it's the only journalism course I've ever taken. Um, uh, not because I was that good, but because she was that good. Um, and I actually still sit up a little straight just thinking about her, um, because uh, <laughs> she was a, um, a woman of basic fundamentals, get it first, get it right, um, and, uh, and she really, and blessedly followed my career her whole life, and I, I got to give her a lot of pride, and I've actually endowed a scholarship at the University of Minnesota Journalism School in her honor. You she know. must be um, so proud. Oh, she's passed away since, but, um, uh, but in 10th grade, my, um, uh, my mom and dad took me to Israel um, during Christmas break. It was the first time I'd been on an airplane, and it was the first time I was out of the state of Minnesota, except for some brief forays uh, for summer camp into Wisconsin. And I fell in love with the Middle East, and I um, uh, came back. I, I spent all three summers of high school living on a kibbutz in Israel. And then I started taking Arabic as a freshman at the University of Minnesota. Eventually got my BA from uh, Brandeis in Arabic. Um, and, uh, and then I had a Marshall Scholarship. Then I got a sort of classic British Arabist education at St. Anthony's College, Oxford. And, um, uh, but my years in London, I actually got my start in journalism. Uh, because I was, I wrote a little for my college paper, but um, I was walking down a street in London in 1976 with my then girlfriend, now wife, uh, who's sitting in the front row, and um, and was at the London School of Economics. And um, the Evening Standard, the uh, British, you know, they always have those blaring headlines, you know, Brad to Jen, we're finished. You know, um, and uh, <laughs> this blaring headline said, Carter to Jews, colon, if elected, I promise to ha fire Dr. K. And I stopped my then girlfriend, now wife, and said, look at that headline. Um, uh, Jimmy Carter's running for president, trying to win Jewish votes by promising to fire the first ever Jewish Secretary of State. And um, I have no idea what possessed me. Um, but I went back to my dorm room, and I wrote a column about it. And my then girlfriend, now wife, um, uh, happened to be a neighbor of Gilbert Cranberg, the editorial page editor of the Des Moines Register. And my then girlfriend, now wife, took that column home on spring break, walked it over to the home of Gilbert Cranberg. He liked it, and they printed it on a half page of the Des Moines Register with an Outh cartoon, and they paid me $50. <laughs> and I thought that was the coolest thing in the whole world. I was walking down the street. I had an idea. I wrote it up, and someone paid me $50. And so that really got my start. I wrote op-eds for the Des Moines Register and the Minneapolis Star and Tribune throughout my time in graduate school. And when I applied and got my start to, at UPI, all I had were these op-ed pieces. I'd never covered a fire. I'd never covered a city hall meeting. But they figured if I could write those, they could teach me how to cover a fire. And that's how I got started. <laughs> wow. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's incredible. Yeah. What compels you to write about the topics you write about? So, you know, um, I, I, as I shared with, um, uh, you know, Chris and Curtis, I'm actually working on a book now on, on how to write a column. Since everyone wants to be a columnist, I thought at the end of my career I might share what I learned. And the first chapter, um, actually, Curtis, is, is about why I write. Um, and I write basically for three reasons. One is, first and foremost, I write to learn. So um, although I'm an opinion columnist, and it may seem I'm very opinionated, I'm actually not a very ideological person. So my writing, my opinions emerge from my reporting. And um, I've always said I don't write my books, I discover my books. So I start with an intuition. Feels like the world's kind of flat out there. You know, that's kind of a big block of granite. And then I do the reporting, and I chip away, and I see an ear and a knuckle, you know, and a nose and an eye, and then I, I chip away some, it's a very iterative process. So first of all, I write, I write to learn. Second of all, I write because it's my form of idealism. And it's something that Anne and I were remarking, you and I have in common. It's actually your motto. Well-informed citizens make better decisions. So I live by a variation of that motto. It's by Marie Curie. Now is the time to understand more so we may fear less. Now is the time to understand more so we may fear less. We live in an age where it's become an industry 
to make people frightened and stupid. Um, it's actually become a big, big business now. And um, so my idealism is that I want to, um, so I, when people ask me what I do for a living, I tell them I'm a translator from English to English. Okay, <laughs> I take really complicated topics and break them down so I can understand them and then hopefully share them to others so they will understand more and fear less. Um, and the third reason I, I write is that um, uh, I, I need the eggs. Um, you may recall the great scene in Annie Hall where Woody Allen, the guy goes to a doctor and says, Doctor, Doctor, I have a terrible problem. My brother thinks he's a chicken. And the doctor says, well, just tell him he's not a chicken. He says, I can't. I need the eggs. <laughs> and um, uh, so um, uh, there's something completely irrational. But, um, uh, you know, this happens every so often. But about, I don't know, at the height of the Ukraine war, this was probably a couple of months ago, I, I, was, I woke up at 4.30 in the morning, and this happens sometimes. And a column is writing itself in my head. Um, uh, you know, Ann and I are blessedly friends with Paul Simon, and Paul has told us sometimes with, with music, he wakes up in the middle of the night and says, he says, Tom, I'm just taking dictation. And the muse is in residence. So I wake up, and a column will write itself whole in my head. And I got up at 4.30 in the morning, and I just put it into my computer. I waited until my editors woke up at 8.30. They, you know, I told them what I wanted to write. They loved it. Um, got a fact checker and an editor. And by 2.30 in the afternoon, what was rolling around in my head was on the homepage of the New York Times as the lead column. And that is the greatest buzz in the world, OK? <laughs> um, you are home. You're in bed. Um, you have an idea. You pull it together. Your editors like it. And it's shared with 10 million subscribers to our website all over the world. And um, those are the eggs. And I. I can't imagine not having that one day. One day I won't have that, but that is just an incredible uh, 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 privilege. Making something very meaningful. Yes. Yes, absolutely. You, know, I'm, you, you mentioned the word Ukraine, and we don't want to go down too much down a rabbit hole, but you, you've explained how you see the war in Ukraine very differently than at least I saw it. Can you, can you talk about that and, and the, the connectivity and, the, and the, sure. this notion of, of it's a new, it's something new yeah. I've never seen. Well, you know, I have a lot of, you know, strange connection to this story because um, back when I was starting as a columnist, 1995, um, uh, the issue of NATO expansion was really, I was coming off working at the, actually the Clinton White House uh, as the White House reporter, and then uh, I was a column, became a columnist in 1995, and um, uh, I don't think it'd be an exaggeration to say I was the most outspoken opponent of NATO expansion. Um, uh, in, the, in the punditocracy. Um, and my allies were Sam Nunn um, uh, from Georgia, Bill Bradley, Senator, uh, Bill Perry, uh, uh, Bill Clinton's uh, uh, Defense Secretary, and Michael Mandelbaum, an academic, and Dick Lugar even. Um, and all of us, it wasn't an ideological thing. I, it struck us all as common sense. We had prayed our whole lives that the Soviet communism would collapse and be replaced by a democratic Russia. And it just seemed to me um, uh, rather unfortunate that the first thing we would do in the wake of that is expand NATO. Um, maybe you'd wait five years or five days or, or, or whatever, but that just struck me as deeply unwise. And um, I had the really incredible opportunity to interview George Kennan, then 92 years old at his home in Princeton, who talked about why this was an awful idea. And he was the father of containment. So. Um, so I had that background you know, on this story, and then suddenly Ukraine comes uh, forward, Chris. So that was part of the, the way I, I, I kind of looked at this. Now, I think NATO expansion is not the issue today. It's actually, uh, you know, I, I think it's more Putin expansion than NATO expansion. But um, the way I framed the story is that um, I believe this is World War I. What, what we call World War I actually wasn't a world war. Half the world was colonized then. Um, uh, and, and even World War II, uh, many countries were colonized and um, many people were just subsistence farmers. They really weren't participating in it. This is the first world war. And you know that by the fact that two weeks into the war, Argentinian farmers were unable to plant their crops because diesel prices had gone up so high and fertilizer was in such, such short supply because these two countries in Europe, half a world away, decided to go to war. And this is a war happening at a time when two-thirds of the planet now have smartphones. So they can watch it, opine about it, react to it. This is World War I. 
Well, and gas and grain. Oh, everything is being, food prices were all being affected by the fact that Putin decided to, to go to war against Ukraine. And um, people have asked me, you know, um, you know, how to think about the war. And I tell them, you know, when a war like this starts, you always ask yourself as a columnist, where should I be? Should I be in Kiev, Moscow, Warsaw, Berlin, Washington, London, Brussels? Where, where should I be? And there's only been one place to be for this war from the very beginning and still to this moment. And that's in Vladimir Putin's head. Because the only, this war is combusted, started, and driven by him. And the only way to understand where it's going to go, when it might end, is to be in his head. And, and that's a very difficult place to be. What role do you think the climate crisis plays in this conflict? Um, well, this would be, you know, I think uh, we'd say, Curtis, this, this, this um, story is a, is a real stressor. So this war um, uh, is, is, a, is an event that at a time when climate is already um, stressing uh, places and the environment. So let's just think about Europe. I talked about this a little last night at the ACES dinner. Um, so 104 degrees um, in Central Europe right now, um, and also a drought. So the rivers are low. So the coal barges can't get down the rivers to feed the, the coal-fired power plants. The nuclear plants can't be cooled because the water is too hot. Um, and also, um, it, it, it leaves them really to the, to the vagaries of the wind and the sun, um, and most of all, to Vladimir Putin's natural gas. So you see, it's all intersecting now, you know, where the climate crisis is exacerbating or being exacerbated by the war. And, um, uh, and I don't think you can understand this conflict without bringing that into it. I think it's a central theme of what we wanted to talk to you about, which is that you know, we've seen these, these factors in our world, and, and I wonder if it's a coincidence that we're seeing rising authoritarianism at the same time that the climate crisis is yeah. going from something that's been projected to happen to something right. that's happening. Are, the, are these two things related? To it's you? a very good question. You know, um, I've thought about that a lot, you know, because um, if you look around the world, um, the, the democracy waves that uh, Sam Huntington, you know, spoke about, clearly seem to have crested. And it's been a very good season for autocrats. I especially look at the, in the region that I covered most intimately, the Middle East, you know. And I happen to think what's going on is something that's difficult to quantify, Curtis, but I think it has to do actually with social networks and new technologies. Um, that I believe that social networks and new technologies, whether it's facial recognition or um, sensing devices. I think what they're doing is making in, in, inefficient authoritarians more efficient. I think they're making efficient authoritarians. China, if you watch how China's been trying to suppress COVID, I mean, literally there's scenes of a drone will come out of the sky and, and identify a woman by facial recognition and say, why are you out? You're supposed to be quarantined. So it's making inefficient authoritarians more efficient. <laughs> These technologies are making efficient authoritarians super efficient, and they're making democracies ungovernable. That that's, I think, the paradox of these, uh, of these technologies, you know. And um, I, uh, uh, I wrote about this a little recently because, um, so I, I wrote a book in 1999 called Lexus and the Olive Tree. And in that book, I identified, now this was five years before the Netscape web browser. So it was just the beginning of this thing called the internet. And um, I, I described for myself this place called cyberspace. And I said, cyberspace is a realm where we're all connected, but no one's in charge. It's a realm where we're all connected, but no one's in charge. Well, in 2007, China formed a ministry of cyberspace. Because China said to its own people, Oh, no, 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 no. There'll be no realm here where we're all connected and no one's in charge. Uh, you want to be on Sinoebo, our Facebook, Twitter? You will be there uh, as Thomas L. Friedman, you know, with your picture. You will not be anonymous. You want to have a cloud server? It will be under our control. Bitcoin, a currency out of the government's control? Not a chance. Um, Telegram? an encrypted app that you can communicate with each, with, with each other without, no way. So what did China do? 
it projected its Chinese authoritarian values into China cyberspace. What do we do? We sit around and say, please, Mark, please, Cheryl, please, please be nice. If we asked you pretty please, would you not put that venom into your algorithm that's dividing us? Um, would you please keep an eye on um, all the ways that uh, Russians and other autocrats are gaming your network? P pretty please, if I ask three times? That's what we do. So they have projected their authoritarian values into cyberspace, and we have fundamentally failed to project our democratic values into cyberspace. And that is a real problem. Yeah. Yeah. Since we're pivoting toward democracy, let me go back to democracy in the United States. So the, the Supreme Court, as everyone knows, is rolling back the EPA's ability to regulate power plants, which is our clean air and our climate, right? So, Tom, do you see a, a path for, there's two paths, there's the political path, and then is there another path? Do you see a path forward if politics fails, and can politics get us there? Um, it's a climate, a, yeah, it's a really, really good, energy and climate. Really good question, and, and my whole focus has been um, to put my energy uh, behind innovation and innovators, you know, um, and to try to use my column to spotlight um, uh, you know, the people doing the innovation to try to help them get to scale. Because um, I think that's how great change will happen. Not that I'm not concerned about these laws and these changes, um, but I do believe that ultimately we're gonna have to invent our way out of this crisis. And when we do, when we can basically invent the clean, um, uh, cheap electron tools in this country and systems and, and get them down the cost volume curve, so in India and China they can scale, um, uh, you know, that's how it's gonna tip. So that, that's really been, been my focus, but not that I'm in any way not concerned about these things. And um, so that's what I've tried to, to highlight myself. Well, you said, you, I heard you say the other day something that I thought was interesting, because for me, a problem has always been, really we can't all agree, we can't make the environment non-political, we don't all like clean air, clean water, clean food. And you said, someone asked you, well, what would you do if you were president? And your answer was, I'd take the three CEOs of the three biggest oil companies, and I'd take the three CEOs, the two biggest, three biggest environmental groups, I'd put them up at Camp David, I'd surround them by fence and tanks, and say, don't come out until you've got a solution, a 10-year yeah. solution. And because, I love yeah. that, because it, I, it's pulling people together. It's the two sides. I mean, Well, you know, I, I start, um, Chris, with the, with the view that I don't know this from experience, uh, but I'm told that if you jump off the top of a 100-story building, for 99 floors, you can think you're flying, okay? Um, uh, it's the sudden stop at the end that tells you you're actually not flying. So um, I wish we had sufficient clean electrons uh, now to um, go off oil and coal, coal turkey. Oh, boy, I, I truly wish that, and the distribution to do it, but we don't. So it seems to me that the challenge right now, particularly in the context of Ukraine, um, is that we need to have a green transition, a, a radically rapid green transition. But there's gonna be a transition. We cannot flip a switch. I wish we could, but we can't. And we are in a context right now where if we force American consumers and Europeans, I mean, the European Union has committed to getting off Russian oil by January 1st. Well, unless there is a cheap alternative, I had an Eastern European prime minister called me last week to tell me how stressed his country is right now, basically with food prices, energy prices, and home uh, electricity prices, especially with air conditioning you know, going up. So if we don't have a cheap energy solution, and you force Europeans or Americans to choose between heating or eating, or cooling or eating, that's gonna kill the green movement. People are just going to say, sorry, I, Chris, I, I, I get you, but I'm really not interested right now, okay? Because I either air condition my home or I don't buy groceries. And so we have, we're in a real predicament now. We need lower oil prices right now to get people through this crisis and to undermine Putin, who starts a war. We're funding both sides in the war. So we fund our own Army, Navy, and Air Force with our tax dollars, and we fund his Army, Navy, and Air Force with our energy purchases. That's stupid, you know? Um, and so we need to find a way to get more in the short term 
um, uh, cheap uh, fossil fuel gasoline uh, to, to basically get people out of this crisis while we keep our eye on the longer term goal. And I think the only way to do that, you know, I'm a big believer, I learned this covering the Middle East, the way you get big change in the world is when you get the big players to do the right thing for the wrong reasons. If you wait for everyone to do the right thing for the right reasons, you will never get scale at the speed and scope you need. So I'm all for you know, um, uh, getting my, some of my favorite you know, environmental teachers on one side of that table, get the oil company executives on the other side of the table, and have a real conversation. Look, we're going to have a green transition. You oil companies, you say you're going to be carbon zero, net, net zero by 2050. How does 2030 sound to you? Okay. Um, uh, you all, um, uh, how about a carbon tax? A lot of them actually, you could be brought around to that. Some of them already supported it. Um, how about an independent international body to monitor your methane um, uh, uh, escape and, um, and at a zero tolerance level? Okay, in return for that, maybe we're gonna let you drill and pump here to get the prices up. Look, the, something really bad just happened last week. Saudi Arabia says it has two billion barrels a day oil extra and reserve that it could pump if President Biden spoke nicely to MBS. If you talk to our oil companies, they actually really have two million barrels a day that they could pump. And I'm sorry to say our president went to Saudi Arabia rather than sitting down with our own oil companies. I am not fans of these guys, don't get me wrong, but this is hard-headed stuff because the green movement will get crushed. It will get crushed if people are forced to heat or eat. And that's, that's controversial, because you just said low price of gas. Yeah. Which, on one hand... It's the last thing want. I want. So, yeah, it's the yeah. last thing. It's the only we all yeah. want it, but it's yeah. also the last thing we want. Right. But it's about transition. It's about yeah. easing into a transition. And by the way, if somebody has a better idea, please come up to me afterwards. <laughs> okay. I'm all for it, you know. But um, we live in a world of trade-offs, and we live in a world of transitions. And if you pretend there's no trade-off, that you're the person who thinks you're flying for 99 floors. Do you have any confidence that, that these goals will be met? No, I don't. Um, uh, <laughs> um, I, I just, um, it's a perfectly legitimate question, Curtis. I just don't see the alternative right now. That's, um, uh, I try to be hard-headed about this, you know. I mean, I've always said, I'm not a nice green, I'm a mean green. Um, and by mean green, I mean, I think we have to be as hard-headed as the oil and coal companies, you know, uh, as we do these things. And I think we have leverage on them. Um, and, and I think we should, we should use it. They also have some leverage on us right now. And you can do that, or you can, you can think you're flying. But there will be a hard stop at the end. So a, a central thesis of your, of your writing yeah. over the years is that advances in technology and, and global markets ha have made us uh, as individuals and, and as nations more equal or shorthand yeah. the world is, is flat or flattening at least, right? Um, equal not in uh, income, uh, but equal in having access to a platform mm -hmm. that more people have equal opportunity to access. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, but important distinction. I wonder though, have the shocks of the recent past, pandemic, inflation, rising authoritarianism, the climate crisis, this, this World War I, yeah. has that undermined that notion? And, and do you think that maybe we're not as flat or as flattening as maybe we were in what you saw in say 2007? It's a, it's a very good question. So, um, uh, cause I get asked this a lot. And so um, uh, it's confused for me, my answer is when I, when I went out and said the world is flat. Mm -hmm. What my book was about um, was not um, uh, one of equal incomes, mm -hmm. um, uh, and it was not that the world was all gonna converge mm -hmm. into one happy nation. Mm -hmm. um, the, the argument was that more people in more places mm -hmm. uh, have the opportunity to compete, connect, and collaborate in more ways for less money around more things than ever before. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so what, what I was basically arguing is that um, uh, when, when the Ukraine war started, first week of the war, maybe second week of the war, um, uh, well, let me step, step back. What the thesis of the world is flat was, was that for millennia, to act globally, you had to be a country. 
And then beginning with the Dutch East India Company and you know, uh, some of these big, sort of big trading houses, you had to be a company to act globally. What I argued in the book that what was the new, new thing about this platform of connectivity was you could act globally as an individual. That was the key argument of the book. Nothing to do with equality. And so let's go now to the videotape, the first week of the war. This is a small example, but there are many bigger ones. Airbnb. Someone woke up one day and said, you know what, I want to help someone in Ukraine. First week of the war. I, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to rent a room in Lviv for five nights from someone I don't even know, Mr. Ukraine, and I'm not going to use the room. I'm just going to transfer money to that guy for his family and his home. Within a week, $20 million of reservations on Airbnb were sent as contributions by people who reserved rooms, paid for them, and never used them. USAID hadn't even tied its shoes yet, and Brian Chesky at Airbnb had transferred $20 million overnight. Week two of the war, a Ukrainian parliamentarian tweets at Elon Musk, the Russians are, are shutting down our internet. Do you think you could bring Starlink here? Two weeks later, Elon Musk has his satellites providing internet service over Ukraine. Was your grandmother doing that? You know, I don't think so. So whenever people tell me, hey, Friedman, is the world still flat? My answer is, are you kidding? Are you paying attention? Do you see what's going on? Okay, because it's for me about the ability of individuals to act globally. So the fact that, um, uh, you know, countries are closing down and, and, and whatever, and borders are closing, that's not what I'm talking about. Last week I interviewed um, uh, a Ukrainian who created an app um, which was called Track Your Favorite Oligarch. And you put it on your phone, and the way it works is you're a waiter at a restaurant in Paris, and some Russian oligarch comes and you wait on him, or you park his car, you take a picture of him, you upload it, and they send it to Interpol. Was your grandmother doing that, okay? <laughs> so, so when people tell me there's nothing new, we're just going back, they just say, please, are you paying attention? It's about the ability of individuals to act globally. That's what the book was about. And it was happening because all of this technology was, was this plumbing was being put in place. And it's happening farther, faster, deeper, cheaper than ever before. And, and it's fascinating to watch that phenomenon you describe interact with these, with these major oh, geopolitical Absolutely. Yeah. And, it's, um, uh, and so I'm always kind of watching, you know, for these kind of things. You know, first week of the war, you know, the Ukrainians, you know, basically asked Google Maps to not show their traffic jams because um, the Russians were targeting them, you know, where they saw a collection of cars, you know, getting out. And so, and then second week of the war, Ukrainian babushkas were using their iPhones to basically um, geolocate Russian tanks in their backyard, and the Ukrainians were zapping them. Was your grandmother doing that? Okay, back in the shtetl. I don't think so. So, I, pardon me, but I just so get so tired of this, of Friedman, is the world still flat? Are you paying attention, you know? So, pardon me, so it's a, <laughs> Okay. Back, going, moving back to climate a little Please. bit. I mean, we've, been, <laughs> we've been in this climate sweet spot for 10,000 years, and now oceans are rising, fires, drought, Im forced immigration or migration, you know the deal. So two questions. One is about whether you're optimistic about the future, but, but the more specific question is solutions. Because I, I don't know, I think you wrote this. I, I may be misquoting you, so forgive me if I do. But the, an example of a solution is Denmark. So when I heard that, I thought, okay, is that is that apples to apples? You know, if you're an American, the first thing that goes to your head is, yeah, Denmark's great, but the taxes. You know, do, are you going to ever get that kind of situation, yeah. government-run sustainability, essentially, in America, where we don't we don't go for that? So I don't know. Two let me, let me try to answer that, uh, uh, that question, because you know, do it in a backhanded way of just sort of kind of what is new, what, what's a reason for optimism? This, will, this is really circuitous, so bear with me. January 3rd, 2020, um, Anne and I and her family were on vacation in New Zealand. And I got a phone call from my editors that um, the Trump administration had just assassinated Qasem Soleimani, the leader of the Revolutionary Guards. And um, they wanted me to write a column about it. 
He said, guys, I'm in New Zealand. It's very far from Iran. We're here, Iran's here. Um, and I'm on vacation, leave me alone. Um, and, uh, but being myself, you know, I stewed over it. And the next morning I opened up my computer, and this happens also every once in a while, where I'm like out of body, where I'm watching what I'm gonna type, because I have no idea what I'm gonna type. And, um, and this happens sometimes, I just open the computer, see what happens. And I typed the following sentence, America just assassinated the dumbest man in Iran. And I looked at that and I said, where did that come from, okay? Um, but it was telling me something. I, I said, why did I write that? Here's what I was saying, and this is what the column was about. It was saying, you know, Mr. Suleimani, I'm not gonna judge you in your terms. Your terms is that I was a resistance leader. I resisted the Americans, I resisted the Yehudis, I resisted people, and then we resisted you. No, I'm actually gonna judge you in a different way. I'm gonna judge you in the context in which your country is actually living. And let me explain that to you, okay? Your population has gone from 40 million in 1979 to 85 million. Um, the biggest lake in the Middle East, Lake Urmia, in northwest Iran, is basically a dried up because of climate change and uh, overuse and damming. You just had water riots in the southern part of your country. Water, you had to kill people who were questing for water. And what is your business model in that context? Your business model was to hire Arab Shiites to kill Arab Sunnis in Iraq, Lebanon, Yemen, and Syria. That was your business model. You're the dumbest man in Iran. By the way, Iranians wrote me from all over the world to, to thank me for saying this. Now, um, a po in that article I said, there's actually a new kind of leader emerging in the Middle East though. Leaders who are saying, judge me, not on my resistance, how much resistance I produce, but how much resilience I produce. So you're seeing a shift there between the resistance model and the resilience model. I'm gonna get my legitimacy through res building resilience and enabling my young people to realize their full potential in the actual climate and economic world we're in and not the resistance model. And that's what the Abraham Accords, that's what drove it. That's what it was about in the bottom. Um, you know, a funny thing, half people didn't see it, I, I wrote about it, it was just a paragraph, but uh, the UAE, Israel and Jordan, uh, well, we're about to sign a deal where um, Jordan was going to provide massive real estate for solar panels, Israel was going to build a desalination plant, and the UAE was going to fund it. So basically it would be solar power desalination that would be shared with Palestinians, Jordanians, and Israelis funded by the UAE as a, as a profit-making thing. And at the last minute, um, they were at the signing ceremony actually in Bahrain. John Kerry was there. And the phone rings, and it was MBS in Saudi Arabia. And he basically ordered MBZ the leader of the UA, not to sign it. So actually, if you look at the news story, it says they, they initialed it, but they didn't sign it. And I mean, they told me what, what happened. MBS said, I want to do that deal. Now, this is not any way to defend what he did and with Khashoggi, which was one of the most horrific things I've ever seen. All I'm telling you is a different kind of competition now um, over who is the real resilience leader in the region and not the resistance leader. And I think that's an important shift. Okay, but back to that headline, you, do you, this is not a joke. Do you ever fear for your life? Me? Yeah. Um, uh, mostly when I appear on American university campuses. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, but uh, uh, it's a joke, but not really. Um, it's, uh, uh, um, you know, I've been doing this for a long time, and um, uh, I, I, I know, yeah, yeah, I am so old. Um, that, um, that there was a dinner, it was a wonderful dinner in Washington uh, last month where actually Yusuf Alateba, the UAE ambassador, gave a dinner for Michael Herzog, the Israeli ambassador. Wow, it was amazing. I mean, if you've been doing this as long as I have, like, that's amazing. And they asked me to give a toast at the opening. And my toast was, I am so old that I knew both your fathers, okay? <laughs> and um, I, uh, I knew uh, um, Yusuf, uh, Yusuf's father, um, uh, Manasseh Dalateba, who was the UAE oil minister when I covered OPEC. 
and I knew Michael's father, who was the president of Israel, who was a, a friend of mine. So that's how old I am. So I've survived um, by, uh, and this is a segue back to journalism, Curtis. Uh, um, uh, I've survived all these years. Um, I mean, I've been lucky just not to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, you know, and that happens. Um, and I try to be prudent about where I go, you know, um, and uh, all that. Speaking Arabic? Does yeah, I help? mean, just, uh, well, yeah, but you can, you know, you can get in trouble in a lot of ways, you know, um, in, your own, in English or in, in, in any other language. But um, my survival mechanism, um, you know, Chris has really been, and, and this is the working title of my book, the book is called What You Say When You Listen. And um, it it's, comes from the fact that, um, you know, I was a little Jewish kid in Minneapolis who wanted to cover the Arab Muslim world in the 1970s. That was not a natural thing. Um, and, uh, um, and, and so um, when I first got hired by UPI, I had to persuade them. I, we, Ann and I were in London, I started on Fleet Street, and the number two man in the Beirut Bureau of UPI got shot by a man robbing a jewelry store on Hamra Street. And they came to me, he said, I wanna get out of here, and they came to me, all of 25 years old, um, and said, would you like to replace him? Um, and I said, I would, I'd love to, you know. Your predecessor got shot, but that's okay, you know. Um, and uh, so I, um, uh, but I had to beg and borrow and persuade them to send me with my background to Beirut, and they did. And then when Abe Rosenthal hired me at the New York Times, his first question was, you know, how can I send you to be the New York Times bureau chief in Beirut? Um, and so my survival mechanism is, uh, was to be a good listener. Because two things happen when you listen. One is what you learn when you listen. All the mistakes I've made as a journalist were because I was talking when I should have been listening. But the second thing, and the more important thing about listening, is that listening is a sign of respect. And it's amazing what people will let you ask them, and even say to them, if they think you respect them. If they think you respect them, you can tell them this, anything. If they don't think you respect them, you cannot tell them the sun is shining. So my survival mechanism was to be a good listener. And my, my stuff is hot. I'm not out there saying, you're all great, you're all wonderful, it's all the Yehudi's fault. You know, I'm, I'm in people's face a lot. But they know one thing, I really want them to succeed. I like the people, I like the culture, I like the region. I really want them to be able to realize their full potential. potential. I'm not gonna BS them though, and they know that too. And so I've survived all these years and still have access and still get read because most, first and foremost, I, I try to be a good listener, and that is a sign of respect. And it's the most important lesson in journalism. And, and a marriage as well. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get me started. <laughs> that's, that's really good advice. Um, turning things back to the health of, of our uh, body politic here, uh, you wrote a column in April I really liked called China and Russia are giving authoritarianism, authoritarianism a bad name. And you detailed how uh, recent examples of these high coercion, low information regimes uh, are just not able to adapt to rapidly changing challenges, circumstances, and that our most important uh, competitive advantage that any society in our country could have is the ability to vote out incompetent leaders and maintain information ecosystems that will expose systemic line and defy censorship. How are we doing on, on those fronts? Yeah. <laughs> so what time is it? Uh, and, and, um, and, and especially the, you know, when you look yeah. at the, the state of the local press right, sure. across this country. Well, you know, I agreed to do this um, for one reason, uh, this event, uh, to support what you're doing. Because um, uh, local journalism um, is, is really, is so important, Curtis. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll tell you a story that President Obama told to my colleague, um, Ezra Klein, in an interview he did last year. And it, it'll tell you everything about why your work is so important. Obama was talking about the shift in news reporting and news ecosystem in America um, in the last 20 years. And he recalled back in the early 2000s when he was running for president. He said, you know, I could go down downstate Illinois, you know, Southern Illinois, and uh, small town, very conservative. And I could meet with a local newspaper editor. And um, 
We talked for an hour. Probably a conservative guy, white guy, conservative guy. And afterwards, after an hour, he'd say, you know what? Black guy's okay. Black guy's okay. I think, I think I'm gonna endorse the black guy. And his local newspaper would do that. Today, the editor's not there. The newspaper's not there. Um, no one's covering City Hall. No one's covering the school board. No one's covering the high school football team. And so what happens instead, you've lost a buffer, and now it goes directly from Sean Hannity to the local barbershop, or if you don't, you know, from MSNBC to a local barbershop with no buffer at all, and so every issue gets nationalized. And that's why we cannot have a healthy democracy without local journalism. I actually once had a, had a chance to suggest this personally to Mark Zuckerberg. He probably thought I was nuts, and I'm sure he doesn't remember. But I said, if you want to do a really good deed, why don't you pick out two newspapers, two local papers in 50 states, 100 newspapers, and tell each of them you will buy 100,000 digital subscriptions to their newspapers for five years to get them over the hump from print to digital. They can't do it after five years, they can't do it. But that would actually be the Lord's work. If you really want to repent for your <laughs> grievous sin, I didn't say this, um, but that is what they should be doing. Because without local journalism, you know, my wife has built an amazing museum in Washington called Planet Word, which all of you must come and visit. And, um, but it's built on the same premise. Anne's argument is that without a literate public, we're not gonna be able to maintain a democracy. And without local journalism, by the way, right, left, or center, I don't care, as long as it's anchored in this community and starts there um, in the Tocquevillian sense of that's the really ground zero of our democracy. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not going to work. So we gave you a donation last year, and I hope every person in this room goes home and goes on their website and writes you a check. Thank you. I mean that. Thank you. Thank you. I think I think that is the best way to end this dialogue right now. <laughs> and that and that's I think maybe the most important lesson of tonight is what you just said. So with that, I want to shift it to an audience Q and A. But let's be. I'm gonna be clear with everybody. This is gonna be short. If you give a long question, we're gonna cut you off. <laughs> and this isn't forever. This is like five minutes. We're gonna <laughs> choose you. So. Are you ready on your mark, get set? You did raise your hand first. Yeah. Can we get a, and, and don't speak until the mic comes to you. And please be polite. I'm delighted you talked about local journalism. And I want to suggest a column about journalistic integrity in mm -hmm. the First Amendment. It's about a Russian oligarch mm -hmm. who intimidated a West Virginia corporation the Ogden Corporation, to muzzle a local newspaper, the Aspen Times, fire the beloved editor-in-chief, and essentially blow up the newsroom. Thank you. You know, I... Um, Are you familiar with that? Yeah, I, 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 I wasn't familiar with this story until I came here, you know, uh, in the last 10 days, and um, I made a mental note to, to share that with the... I'm, I'm on the editorial side of the paper, but to share that with the news side of the paper, because I think... Um, I think it deserves some attention. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yes, right there, Molly, right behind you. Amory. Amory. Hi, Tom. Some of us feel that Putin's war, besides achieving a lot of other stuff he dreaded, has blown up the fossil fuel era by the way it has radically sped Europe's journey toward efficiency of renewables in a way that echoes around the world. And we actually have, for the first time, a high carbon tax worldwide uh, in the form of those prices. Yes. Um, and if, if Europe continues with the focus and resolve it's shown so far, and the rest of us support that, uh, do you think it might turn out uh, that uh, Ukraine's agony might not have been in vain? I think one sign of that is that Renewables are now so big and growing so fast that uh, they cover all the growth in demand 
And all, in all likelihood, peak fossil fuel, peak oil, peak CO2 already happened in 2019. So that's a really good question. I actually ended a column. Um, uh, you might have even written me about it uh, um, uh, a month ago, in which I basically said, wouldn't it be ironic if Putin's war, you know, was the, because unlike, um, I was thinking back, Amory, to, um, I, I echoed, uh, brought up 1973, which is when I was starting, and I started as a journalist in 78. Back then, there was, in that oil crisis, there was no alternative industry. Now, there's a huge alternative industry, and I said, wouldn't it be ironic um, and delicious if uh, this war actually is what tipped um, uh, the whole industry? Um, I think you're right. I think it can be. I hope it will be. I do believe there is a time gap here, there, if we can get through it. Again, that European prime minister wasn't calling me because he thought around the corner he had those renewables. But I think in the fullness of time, that is my wish. And because this is happening in a context where there's massive innovation by people like the Rocky Mountain Institute and others, um, fingers crossed, we just got to get through this transition. One more question right here in the front. Wait for the microphone. Just last night, we heard more about the January 6th incident, the insurrection. And I'd be curious about your opinion about the impact of the reporting and all that. We know about the partisanship in the echo chambers of who you listen to in terms of the news. Do you think it will have an impact, the information they brought forward? Um, so, you know, I don't know, one can only speculate, but my experience as a journalist is that um, uh, one of my rules as a journalist is that everybody talks. There's a great Neon Trees song, you know, by, by that title. Everybody, you think people aren't talking or they're not listening or I only watch Fox, everybody talks. And you think it's just there and I can turn it out here, no, no. There is something seeping through the information ecosystem. You can see it in the polls now. The number of Republicans who say Trump want, they want Trump to run again has fallen from the 70s down to the 50s. That's entirely, that's entirely, I think thanks to, um, I think one of the most courageous women of our day, which is Liz Cheney, you know? And um, uh, uh, I mean, I, all, all, the Democrats in the committee are amazing, our Congressman Jamie Raskin, but, but she, she, she has put her life on the line. She comes from the most pro-Trump state with the most guns, and it's not a joke. And she has dared to do this, and she is, um, she is my hero. You know, so. Okay, one more question. You can take right a couple more if you want. There, did you have one, Tom? Did no, you? no, I, I, okay, what, yeah. all you want. You can, you can right there, right? easy access to get to her, yeah. Thank you, Molly. Right there. Hi, you, you talked about uh, the Russian government and they control their internet and the Chinese control their internet. What are you proposing that the United States do to improve our communication? Eliminate section 230 of the Communications Act and insist that Facebook and Twitter and everybody else have to be like the New York Times. That if you run crazy stuff and lies on on the front page of the paper, you're liable for it. You're responsible for it. And that, that you know, that's, that's the world I live in, you know. Um, and, and so after our last election, you remember Mark Zuckerberg saying, oh, the idea that the Russians gamed our election, that's crazy. You know, no, you are responsible. That will fix this problem overnight. Oh, it might cost you some profits. I only hope it bankrupts you, but it will cost you, you know. <laughs> Um, uh, you know. We are out of time. Thank you all for being here tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Curtis. Thank Very you. much appreciated. Thank you so much. Really enjoyed it. Thank you all.